Hello, this is Darren Pulsifer, Chief Solution Architect of Public Sector at Intel, and welcome to Embracing Digital Transformation, where we investigate effective change leveraging people, process, and technology. On today's episode, we're going to talk about cloud migration and the role of the CIO with special guest Doug Bourgeois. All right, let's let's talk about like a typical journey for like cloud migration in in an organization. Um, what yeah, kind I think, of, what, yeah. what am I gonna where am I gonna land with this? Yeah, I think and and we've seen this pattern, you know, replicated and repeated many many times over you know the last decade. But I would say that um, the methodologies, the um, tools, and even the experience. Um, have matured a lot in the last you know, five, six years to an extremely repeatable processes, right? But when we, when we talk about migrating to the cloud, you know, the first thing is to really decide what your priorities are for migration to the cloud. Um, because in, unless you're the smallest of organization with a handful of systems, which of course there are you know, organizations like that, um, but in, if you're a large organization, a large enterprise, and you have a fairly substantial portfolio, you, you, this is something that, that is going to happen in, in, in stages or waves or, you know, in, in phases. It's not going to happen in one big move. So the first step is really to understand what you have and to, ha and to do, you know, whether you call it discovery or assessment, is some sort of a, a double click on your portfolio and prioritize which systems are going to move to cloud, you know, first. Um, and, and that, you know, doesn't take a lot of time and it doesn't take a lot of resource and it doesn't necessarily take a lot of effort, but it's critically important to go ahead and do that because what you, you don't want to do, and I'll use the, you know, a very extreme example, you don't want to pick the mainframe as the first system to move to the cloud. Right? There's a lot of things that need to be done to get that ready to go to the cloud, right? You want to pick something on the other end of the spectrum, you know, a little more self-contained, more modern technologies, maybe, you know, um, public facing web applications, you know, things like that, or emails, you know, email systems, things like that. Are there, mm -hmm. are there other criteria that you use to determine that you would suggest using to determine whether something goes to the cloud or not? Besides, hey, I like the newer ones. That, that makes sense. The mainframe, there's a lot of moving parts, so probably not right away. What other criteria would you look at for making that de determination on the individual workloads? Yeah, this is something that is a specific example of one of the things that has matured quite a bit in the last you know, five, six years or so. Um, and, and I know personally in my practice here at Deloitte, you know, we've developed and we've um, continue to invest in tools that help us accelerate that process. And um, these tools are um, discovery tools that will either grab, you know, automatically through scans or ingest through a variety of formats, a very, very broad set of data that goes into an analytics model that, that runs an algorithm and looks at a, basically a complexity factor and kind of rank stacks all of the systems, you know, into these different categories. But under the covers, you know, a lot of what's happening is, you know, things like um, integration points, right? You know, you, know, you want to understand what those integration points are. You want to understand the configuration of these existing systems. You know, what's, what software components are in there? What versions are they? Is there something that's incompatible from a right, middleware perspective, as an example, that the cloud can't support? You want to know those sorts of things. A lot of times these um, uh, applications are somewhat families. They kind of, you know, they, they're chatty within the family and they don't necessarily talk to other families so much. So you need to look at where the boundaries are. Um, compliance zones are important as well. So some applications have more than one compliance uh, framework that they have to live in, like PCI or HIPAA as an example, or, um, or FedRAMP, you know, and different, different things like that. Uh, IRS 1075, I mean, there's all kinds of different compliance, you know, frameworks that these, these systems have to live within. So that also is a factor, right? Because when you build out the cloud environments, the landing zones, which is basically step two, right? <laughs> you, you, you figure out what's going first, you know, and you prioritize, you know, this particular one compliance family will focus on that first. You build that cloud to those requirements. Yeah, standard, yeah, yeah. And then you have, then you know exactly what is the, the specific subset of the portfolio that can move to that particular uh, enclave, right? Have, have you ever had um, 
the situation where you're, you're half pregnant on this move and you're going like, I can't move this other half of this and you're stuck in this multi-cloud world or this hybrid world now where maybe I do have a compliance zone in HIPAA, but I didn't realize there was some of that information sitting on a mainframe I can't move, but the rest have already moved to the cloud. Have, how do you relegate that? How do you solve that problem? Yeah, I think we've been, we've been fortunate in that we haven't experienced that, but it's because of the, you know, the maturity in the discovery tools and the analysis that goes behind it. So we've had some cases where, you know, we've had to do a fairly substantial amount of, you know, pre-migration prep work, you know, changes, you know, to the systems to get them ready to shift to the cloud. And so, um, and that goes to the waves, right? The, the first wave is the, always the easiest. It's the, the least amount of tweaking and modifications that need to be made before that those systems are ready to go. The second wave has a little bit more, you know, you may be upgrading operating systems. You may be even changing operating systems, you know, and doing some replatforming from that vantage point. You may be swapping out to a different type of database, you know, tools, and then, and then moving those over. And that's kind of the third wave, which is maybe what I would call more antiquated client server or proprietary architectures. Um, you know, I won't name any, but I think we're familiar with them. Yes, we are. <laughs> and, and those get harder, right? Those, those require, you know, a, a, some con considerable re-architecture in some cases. And I know for one particularly complicated client, you know, we, you know, we did spend, you know, a number of months, you know, if not, you know, six months or more, you know, preparing um, uh, those systems for, you know, their cloud readiness so they would be, uh, easier so, to. I like how mm -hmm. you called it cloud readiness because I've seen some organizations that said, I'm just going to move to the cloud over the weekend. I'm just going to copy my VMs up there and, and I'm done. But you, you, you can do that in the first wave possibly, right? But once you hit the second yep. and third wave, you start understanding as your discovery tools have found, right? That there's interdependencies between applications and, and network, um, Hard-coded IP paths, we've never done that before, right? Or, um, or <laughs> exactly. host tables that have been, you know, monkeyed around with directly. So I, I think it's great that you guys got have these tools to help because that lift and shift mentality really only applies to a very small number of, of migrations. And I love, the, I love the term that you said, cloud ready. Not cloud optimized, just cloud ready. Because that can no, happen that later. later. Yeah. That comes later, yeah. In most cases, as you point out, right? Like you said, the first wave is fairly, fairly straightforward. It almost is, you know, over a, a small period of time to transition those to the cloud. They're they're already virtualized. You know, in some cases, you're sh you're shifting between formats of of the virtualization, but it's really not that complicated. You know, when you get down to it, and those go very quickly. And so that the, the people who talk about moving their entire data centers to the cloud and a number of days or weeks or people that I think are familiar with phase one, but they, they haven't had to live through some of these other, these other phases where there's a, you know, a progressively, you know, complicated, you know, amount of work to get them, um, those systems ready, um, ready for the cloud. Phase two, as you started to refer to, it's almost like post-migration optimization, right? So, you know, in a lot of cases, there's, you know, the drivers to the cloud are very business driven, not necessarily technology. There's timing on things. Sometimes it's leases on major buildings that include data centers that clients are like, I'm getting out of this building, our lease expires. We don't want to extend the lease just for the data center. Our people have, you know, in today's age, they've gone virtual, but, uh, you know, but, you know, pre, you know, pre the, the, the pandemic, people were still thinking about, you know, shifting their, their physical um, office locations and things like that. And, and we have, you know, a lot of clients who had kind of burning platforms to get to the cloud based on other business drivers such as that. And so in those cases, you know, you're, you're not optimizing before you move to the cloud. You're making it cloud ready enough so that you can go ahead and successfully execute the migration. But once you get there, now you've got to optimize because the cost drivers in the cloud are different than the cost, cost drivers in the, in the legacy data center. 
And you don't want to run up a bill that the business can't, doesn't expect and can't afford. And so then post-migration optimization actually should be part of the process of the thinking instead of I just move things from here to there and then I'm done, which is a suboptimal way to look at the problem. I'm glad you brought that up, the optimization thing, because I do have a lot of customers myself that they're like, hey, cloud was supposed to be cheaper. But I'm glad how you said the cost models are different than an on, on-prem cloud or on-prem data center compared to a public cloud. Because you're paying for something, whether it's being used or not, in the public cloud, where that cost in your data center is kind of hidden. Right? Yeah, it's very, it's, it, exactly, it's very hidden. And, you know, when you make, you know, once you make the upfront capital investment in the, in the legacy environment, your operating run cost, you know, to, to maintain those licenses are very, a, a very small percentage of the initial investment, right? In the cloud, it's different, right? Because it's pretty much, it's a, re- it's a rental agreement. <laughs> it's just, it goes on in perpetuity. As long as you're using it, it goes up if you grab more resources. It goes down if you, if you give some back. And so what that translates to, at least in my mind, is um, w- when you take the legacy systems, right, the, the, the architectural, whether, whether it was intentional or not, one of the overarching architectural principles that, that went into many legacy systems was, you know, if there's a problem, throw more memory or throw more CPU or throw more storage at it, right? That's the way that we solved a lot of problems. And the reason we did that is because it worked, you know, <laughs> to a certain extent, you know, you know, architectural sins can be hidden through capacity um, and, and a, additional capability. And we did that, right? And so, the point I'm making is that that was what went into these legacy systems. And when we just lift them up, these, these very inefficiently architected systems and move them to the cloud, now we're running a rental agreement in these kind of high resource intensive systems. And they haven't been, they've never been optimized in that, in that way. Um, well, and so the cost model is way, way, way higher than it actually needs to be or should be. Well, and, and some of the, the cost optimization can be a process change. Um, there was a great study that was done up in uh, Canada where they did a lift and shift of an SAP instance into the cloud and their cost went through the roof. And then they realized, well, we don't use this instance in the middle of the night. So they actually put it to sleep. And then they said, well, we don't use this instance on the weekends. So they went from a 24 seven model to a 16.5 model and they saved a boatload of money. And they're like, oh wow, this is a different, so you don't even have to get down to changing code, but just the way that you're using the systems or before we would just keep them running all the time. Now now maybe you don't need to, Uh, maybe you can, can do that approach. Actually that to me, that's a great example of, um, small level of effort, high value yeah. return, right? Because, you know, once you move to the cloud, there's, there's very simple uh, policy mechanisms that you can, you know, invoke that will do just that, right? That will, you know, if this, you know, virtual server is unutilized for, you know, an hour, you know, whatever, shut it down. Or you can do it based on a schedule, right? If you know what the business schedule looks like, right? So those things are very fundamental, not that difficult to, to employ, but can, can save a, a good chunk of money right out of the gate. Um, while that, you're doing, doing the longer term or re-architect things, which right. take, take more time than ever. But, but that cha- that, that's a mentality change that we have to have, right? That, as you said before, we're already 40 years into architecting these systems, right? To be on all the time and to be highly redundant. And I love how we're throwing more memory and CPUs at it because Hey, Intel gets paid, right? When that happens, <laughs> but um, we would rather the money that you save be used for new ways of doing things and new channels of uh, deploying new products or monetization uh, strategies, whatever it is. Uh, so we we want to see companies succeed by you by using these models. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, that's what excites me about you know what the emerging trend is with cloud right now, because I think um, we're beginning to see, I think finally, I'm a dozen years into this, and we're we're finally beginning to see 
the the drivers of the next wave as it pertains to cloud are outside of the infrastructure and it's no longer just the infrastructure you know value prop or you know the benefits there it's more coming from the organization and their business strategy or their mission strategy to the technology to enable what it is they're trying to accomplish and i'd say you know even in you know, there's a ton of disruption going on in the in the business world right now. I mean, we, we all see it, we live it. Um, you know, so so the, there's uh, uh, these technologies driven from that perspective are creating new businesses, right? So new businesses are emerging through this kind of this modernization, very transformative, you know, mindset that's coming from business leaders, and then we're seeing you know le- legacy type companies trying to compete with these new business models. And so they're driving there from a business perspective as well. And then now, you know, just look at it through the government landscape, right? I mean, the whole government operating model has changed fundamentally as well. I mean, we're not immune to anything that's going on out with the pandemic as well. Plus you have at the federal level administration change, whole new set of priorities, all of these things driving towards citizens, end users, end user experience, you know, transformative training programs. I mean, all of these different things that are business driven. And now that's coming in. And where do we meet, right? We meet at the application level, which is where I think the next wave is really focused on. And I think you are kind of alluding to that as well. Yeah, no, I, I, I think we are in a, in a major shift. And we can blame COVID for it, frankly. Um, okay. I've never seen IT organizations move so fast or be given permission to move so fast on their, on their strategies. It's not that COVID changed our direction. It just accelerated the direction we were already headed um, in, a, in a very extreme way. Um, it's, it's amazing um, what I've already seen just in, in 12 months of this pandemic uh, on the change that's happened. Right? Whole new industries are formed where they stalled before like telemedicine, my goodness. <laughs> Telemedicine is wide open now. Right? I mean, it's it's incredible how fast it um, it it developed, and it had been sitting there stagnant for five or six years, and all yeah. of a sudden, it's not. So, perfect example, perfect example of a you know a, a new business model that has now become the norm, where it existed. Your point is well taken. It existed before. These people weren't interested in changing their their approach to things. But then forced circumstances said, hey, you kind of have to. And then people did it and they realized, hey, this actually works. Yeah, I don't want to go see the doctor. Yeah. <laughs> I'd rather just see him on a Zoom call or, a, you know, that's a whole lot better than picking up some other disease in their office. Right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. People start to see the, you know, the value of, you know, of trying out these different models. And then, and then everyone else, right? So now the entire industry adopts that model. And, and now that's exactly what I'm talking about. The innovation, transformative innovation is occurring, you know, in the cloud. And I've said this for a long time, but now it's actually happening, right? I've, I've had this little saying is that cloud is where innovation happens, right? And, and now we're actually seeing it, right? Because a lot of the systems have been moved to the cloud and now all these new capabilities, whether it's um, you know a virtual access or new systems to support that, um, a lot of embedded analytics in, in the systems now, based on um, some of these transformative you know, working arrangements as well, and, and other use cases driving that too. Hey, this has been wonderful talking. We most definitely want you back on the show again. Uh, you bring a lot of great insight into this whole innovation cloud technology. Uh, So, Doug, thank you very much for coming on today. Thanks for having me, Darren. I really appreciate it. Always enjoy chatting with you about the advancements and the current trends in technology. Thanks for listening to Embracing Digital Transformation today. If you liked our episode, go ahead and give us five stars on your favorite podcast or video streaming site. You can also find out more on embracingdigital.com. Until next time, keep moving forward and do something wonderful.